Okay, so we have been looking at how we can use quantifiers and logical connectives to represent knowledge about the world, about our domain. Let us look at the existential quantifier. If you want to say that some children are tall and we have said this earlier, we should represent this as saying there exists an x such that x is a child and x is tall. This is in contrast to saying that if I had to say all children are tall, I would say for all x, child x implies tall x. Now, in one case we use implication, in one case we use and. Essentially. So, we use implication for the universal case and we use and for the existential case. So, is that correct? One way to verify your representations is to check that the negation of what you are saying is obtained by negating your representation. Okay. So, one way to establish the correctness is to check that it negates correctly. So, if you want to negate that some children are tall, then what you should expect is that all children are not tall. Because if some children are tall and that is not true, that means no ch child is tall. So, either we want to say no child is tall or we want to say all children are not tall, which is the same thing assuming that not tall is the opposite of tall. Now, if we have chosen the implication like we did in the universal case, then if we negated the implication, then this is what we, we would get. We would start by saying that this is our representation. There exists an x, child x implies tall x and we would negate it and we would expect to see that no child is tall, but what we get to see is that once you push the the negation inside and then you push this negation again inside, you get child x and not tall x. What does that read? For all x, x is a child and x is not tall. This is clearly not the negation of some children are tall. Because not only is this saying that all children are tall or something like that, or all children are not tall, it is saying that everyone is a child and everyone is not tall. There is no connection between it being a child and tall. The correct representation when we negate, we get what we expect to see and you can see that what we get is after pushing that knot inside, we get this statement which is can be read as for all x, child x implies not tall x, which is all children are not tall. So, this is a point where students often get confused as to why are we using an and here and this hopefully should clear the air. So, when we talk about tall, we also think of short. And basically, we have antonyms in our language and we define ad predicates in terms of other predicates. This is usually because we wish to translate natural language sentences into logic and the text may use any one of them. Somebody may say the boy is short, somebody may say the boy is not tall, but we should understand them to be the same thing. And we can do that by adding extra sentences to our knowledge base, which define how such predicates are related to each other. So, antonyms are when one is the opposite of the other. So, we can say that for all x, short x is equivalent to saying not tall x, which we could expand. So, if you remember that an equivalence is also a by implication from left hand side to right hand side and from right hand side to left hand side, we could write it as two implications. Then there are hyponyms and hypernyms. Mm -hmm. When we say that a cat is a mammal, we are relating two categories. One is the cat and one is the mammal. So, which is different from all men are mortal, where we approximated a property with a category. But here they are two categories, cats and mammals. And the sentence form is the same, which is not surprising because we are treating properties as categories. 
And we are saying that all cats are mammals by saying prolix catex implies mammalix. When we look at taxonomies and description logics, we will see that we can express this using the is a relation and we will express it by saying a cat is related to mammal by the is a relation. So, their cat is treated as a representation uh, not uh, so basically we represent categories we do not represent variables there. So, the cat is a hypernym of mammal and mammal is the hypernym of cat essentially. This is a one way implication only if x is a cat then x is a mammal the other way around is not necessarily true which is different from equivalence essentially. Then there are words which can be called as melonyms and this is a definition dictionary definition a term that specifies a part of something, but that refers to the whole essentially of the thing. For example, when we say needing more hands to finish the project. So, when you say needing more hands, what you really mean is people and you know hand is just a part of the people. But in melonyms, when we use this phrase, we are referring to them as the whole that it is a part of essentially. Or when we say uh, wheels, uh, set of wheels in driving a new set of wheels, it is like saying driving a new car or something like that or an auto or whatever is your favorite vehicle. When we talk about knowledge representation, we would be interested in this part whole relationship because in many places it would be important. It is a area of representation which has received less attention and I am sure in, in time to come it will receive more attention. The other relation which is that of a hyponyme or a hypernym has really has received a lot of attention because we have constructed taxonomies of things cats are mammals, mammals are animals and that kind of stuff. But part of relation has received less attention in except in some subfields. So, just as we have an abstraction hierarchy made up of uh, is a relation, we would like to have an aggregation hierarchy using is part of relation. Then there are synonyms I think, which is one of the most common things that we use a word having the same or nearly the same meaning according to the dictionary as another in the language such as happy, joyful, elated and so on. A dictionary of synonyms and antonyms are opposite such as sorus is called a thesaurus. A word or an expression accepted as another name for something for example, as Arcadia for pastoral simplicity or Wall Street for US financial ma markets. So, these are called synonyms and metonyms. In biology, there may be one or more scientific names which talk about the same thing. Now, in classical logic, um, which means you know logic in which there are only true and false statements, this nearly the same is kind of difficult to define unless you define a predicate called nearly, which would not capture the semantics of what you are trying to say essentially. When we say that when I say all men are mortal, I mean all humans are mortal, it is just a manner of speaking it is not that they are synonyms because human and men, man and human are not synonyms, man is in fact a hyponym of humans. Now, there is a tool which has come to uh, which has come to be available to all of us from Princeton called WordNet, which is something which one can use if you are moving between language and logic essentially, because it tries to capture all those similarities in language which you want to distill down to something similar or common in logic essentially. So, it is a large lexical database of English nouns, verbs, adjectives and adverbs uh, are ground grouped into sets of cognitive synonyms. So, these are called synsets. So, they put all the words which are cognitively the same meaning uh, because there can be words which have two different meanings, but only if two words have cognitively the same meaning, then it would be into a synset. So, synset is short form for synonym set, each ex expressing a distinct con 
concept. So, you know, word senses can be different. For example, when you say a bank, it could be a river bank or it could be a financial bank, but they would be in different synsets. So, synsets are interlinked by means of conceptual, semantic and lexical relations. So, basically how they relate to each other. The resulting network of meaningfully related words and concepts can be navigated through a browser. There is a link here and all this whole thing I have got from the Princeton website. WordNet is also freely and publicly available, available to download essentially. It makes it a useful tool for computational linguistics and natural language processing. It superficially resembles a thesaurus, but there are some differences as pointed out on their website. WordNet interlinks not just word forms, strings or letters, but specific senses of words. So, that is why we have a synset. As a result, words that are found in close proximity to one another in the network are semantically disambiguated. WordNet labels the semantic relations among the words, whereas groupings of words in a thesaurus do not follow any explicit pattern except for that their meaning is similar. So, by semantic relations, they mean things like synonyms, hyponyms and other things as we will see. The majority of the word net relations, the connections between synsets are from elements which are from the same part of speech. So, POS in, 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 in linguistics or natural language processing stands for part of speech. So, noun is a part of speech, verb is a part of speech, verb phrase is a kind of a verb and so on. So, in some sense it, it is really four different nets, one for nouns, one for verbs, one for adjectives and one for adverbs with a few cross part of speech pointers, cross cross different part of speech. So, cross part of speech relations include uh, morphosemantic links that hold among semantically similar words sharing a stem with the same meaning. So, for example, observe, observant, observation, observatory. These are kind of have the same root word and WordNet also captures the fact that they are related to each other because of the common root. In many of the noun verb pairs that is cross part of speech connections, the semantic role of the noun with respect to the verb has been specified in this knowledge base if you want to call it that. For example, sleeper or sleeping car is a location for the act of sleeping, painter is the agent for the act of painting, while painting or picture is the result of the act of painting. So, these kind of relations which are more conceptual in nature are also captured here. So, if you want to write systems which will read from natural language and convert it into logical and logic and do reasoning with them then WordNet definitely is going to be a good tool to work with. So, remember this example of who was the surgeon? We did an example when you we are talking about consistency and so on. You can, you want to read a story in English and translate it into logic. So, under such situations, since it is not feasible to use every word from natural language as a predicate in logic as we have said repeatedly, because we would need associated rules for every such representation this thing. It would make sense to choose a vocabulary of a restricted set of predicates in the lo lo logic language that you are defining and use a tool like WordNet to express the facts using the chosen vocabulary. So, your vocabulary will have in some sense a conceptual core of words, whereas language is rich and diverse and you should learn to able to map from linguistic utterances into those core utterances essentially. That is a goal we will come back to later as well essentially. Now, you are talking about binary relations.
which we said are relations uh, between two elements in the domain essentially as opposed to categories and properties which are just one elements. So, categories and properties of course are related logically to each other using connectives, but now we are talking about binary predicates or binary relations in which there are two arguments to the predicate. So, let us take a break and come back to this part in the next session.